thrilled to have here and pleased and uh, honored as well. This man doesn't do this very much. The chairman of the NFL Competition Committee and CEO of the Atlanta Falcons, Rich McKay. Good to see you, Rich. How are you? Mr. Eisen, I'm excellent. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for having me. Now, just first things first, though, uh, I'm looking at the, is this your your office? Where, where, where are yes. you zooming in I'm from? In, uh, I'm at the stadium. This is my office at the stadium. Okay. Uh, and uh, have an office at Flowery Branch, but this is my office at the stadium, which you see two relatively good football players over my shoulder, Claude Humphrey and Tommy Novus. Okay. And is that uh, is that a, a Steve Bart, uh, Bartkowski worn helmet over your that's left? Red, what no, you that's just our red helmet. It's our okay. favorite helmet. Uh, <laughs> we, we wear it in our throwback games, and uh, Bart did wear red, yeah. so we, we have a bike red. Okay. I figured, I figured I'd try and just show off my somewhat uh, – Deep yeah, acumen really, of Falcons. You've done your work. You've done your work. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> well, I have to have There's my... a reason you run a solid 6'5". There's a reason that you're good at that. <laughs> it's okay if I'm not at the top of your draft board, but maybe by the end of this conversation, I'll, I'll, I'll be in a better standing. So let me just jump into it, Rich. Folks are wondering what's going on with the kickoff and why you uh, went in this direction. Um, I, and I, I, I know there's player safety on the mind and trying to get this get this this play back into uh, more uh, action uh, in it. So, what what pushed it across the the uh, goal line, if you will, uh, with some arm twisting? It appeared uh, with membership late at night, if you will, <laughs> overnight from Monday to Tuesday. Rich. So I, I think you know history is what got us here, right? This play was a really good play for us. It was a big part of our game. Um, we like the play a lot. There's, a, you know, there's people going in the Hall of Fame this year, Devin Hester, who, you know, made a living on this play, and it was fun to watch. But because of space and speed, the the, the basic format of the kickoff, the run, and then the, uh, the collisions at the end of the run, it just became a, a play for us that from a concussion injury rate, and from a pure injury rate, it just became the most dangerous play for us in football. So what we did basically over time was we continued to evolve the rules. I think the first time we touched this rule that I've been on the committee was 94. And in that one, we were trying to encourage touchbacks. From that point forward, all we've done is encourage, we were trying to encourage returns, I should say. Then from that point forward, when we got more injury data, we just started doing things that brought less returns into it. So the stats I like to use uh, that we show the membership is in 2010, we had 416 touchbacks. And in 2023, we had 1,970. Mm -hmm. so that is somewhat of an increase. Then the other thing, Rich, that really is startling to us that I don't think people realized um, is in 2010, that same year, we had 45,000 kickoff return yards and in 2023, we had 13,000. So we lost 32,000 yards of kickoff returns that were yards in our game that just came out of our game. It was time to make a change. Any change we were going to make was going to be pretty revolutionary, and this one was. It's not going to look like a typical NFL play, but this has been studied by our special teams coaches for about three years, uh, and they've been tinkering with it, looking at the XFL play. We looked at every single kickoff in the XFL. What's this play going to look like to us? Um, we're very comfortable with the changes they made, and we call it the NFL hybrid kickoff because it really is kind of our own play with the lineup and the, having two returners back. Um, there's a complication to it. It's not going to seem simple. I would think by week five it'll look pretty typical to you, but I think in week one, it'll look different. Well, so two guys are, are returning and everybody, uh, the kicker's in the usual spot, a man like literally standing alone uh, and everyone else is five yards apart. Uh, yes, on, on five the yards side. apart on the 40. So the coverage team's on the 40 and the return team's on the 35, right? So they're on the other side of the 50. They're five yards apart. It's just the idea, Rich, you're trying to make more of a punt play. You're trying to make it where those those people are actually blocking each other, moving uh, from a close proximity as opposed to 30 yards away, and uh, that's what we're that's what we're trying to do. And of course, you on the competition committee are are constantly studying consequences, unintended or what have you. Um, so, do you feel? I'm just thinking about it. You got. Uh, everybody five yards apart from each other, and then the the blocking will occur. Um, you know, I guess when the ball passes the twenty in the air, or somebody has to no, touch it no, first. Rich, so no, it's, a, it's so somebody's got to catch it. Got it. It's got to hit the ground before anybody can move. And and there will be just I mean because it's new to us, there will be some adjustments. But well, the way we'll officiate it is, 
we'll do it just like we do now that people have to have their foot on the ground, both the return team and, and the kicking team. You got to have your foot on the ground and that's not going to move till somebody touches um, the ball or touches the ground in that, you know, landing zone, i.e. the 20 yard line to the, uh, to the goal line. Um, from that point forward, you know, defense will come charging down, offense will block and you'll, it'll look like, you know, much more like a punt play. I think what we saw in the XFL was there will be a lot of strategy. There will be some, uh, There'll be some trickery. There'll be some strategy. Uh, you'll see players get tackled inside the 20 uh, for sure. You'll see players that are traditional, you know, in that 20 to 35. Uh, they'll, they'll be the great majority of their turns will end up there. But you will see many more long returns in this setup than we've been producing. Uh, and we like that. How many more? That's I guess that was my question. I, get, what, what, I would think a lot. What are your models? Because I think what it all your... gets switched to the idea of, how many returns are there this year? One thing we did in order to get this rule passed and to make people more comfortable is in the original rule we proposed, we set a touchback, meaning a kick that goes to the end zone and is caught in the end zone when you downed it would come to the 35. Okay. Well, people, we did that in order to motivate people to kick it in the field of play. I think people were nervous about the rules. So we said, okay, instead of playing for this 80 to 90% return, let's move it down to 50%. And let's just move the touchback uh, instead of the 35, make it the 30. So teams could kick it in the end zone if they're nervous about coverage. That will reduce some of the plays. But I do believe you're going to get, you know, so we should be getting at least 25 percent of these plays that get themselves past that 30, 35. Uh, which is way more than we've been getting in the current kickoff configuration. And then, uh, obviously, when you configure a kickoff this way, Rich, the surprise on field onside kick has got to uh, be dead and buried. I mean, you you have to. It, 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 clearly, you can't just do an onside <laughs> kick when when oh. one dude is standing <laughs> by himself. Like you have to declare it. Um, yes. And and in the same way that um, you mentioned Evan Hester at the start of this conversation, in the same way that his return for a touchdown to start a Super Bowl is one of the biggest memories you can have in a Super Bowl, the same thing. I believe in the same stadium in, in South Florida, as a matter of fact, a couple of years well, later, was the surprise yeah. on, on field, onside kick, pardon me, on, on the field. Um, so my, my question for you on that is, is why not then just replace the onside kick with an actual football play that the Philadelphia Eagles keep knocking on the door. Why Why does the 4th and 15 or 4th and 20 play instead of an onside kick keep failing? Um, I, I, I happen to be one that over the years supported the, the idea of the play. Um, traditionalists don't necessarily support the idea of the play. I felt like this year, uh, and I was, you know, I, I, I told Philadelphia this, in my mind, there was just too much to talk about in this new kickoff play. Uh, for them to have an opportunity to get that rule passed. I believe that rule will come back and be discussed uh, and at some point has a chance of passing. But I think for now, the onside kick, in order to get us enough votes to get the new kickoff in, the onside kick was going to stay in its traditional form. <laughs> By the way, I love it, Rich. Uh, and and, and I don't, I'm, I'm not saying this in any way, shape, or form to be disrespectful, that there are captains of industry in that room, right? Captain, and 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 it's just too much for walking and chewing gum at the same time. But yeah, you know, what I mean? that's just the way it works. You know, but it's just you know, Rich. The one thing I love about the balance we have in our league and in that room, yes, is you know, there's people that have just so much respect and so much for the history of the game, and then there are people that are you know the progressives that say, well, let's change, and then what we try to do is bring them data and show them the impact to the game of change and try to say, you know, we're in charge of the quality of the game. That's one of the things that competition committees, uh, you know, charged with. And so our job is to present them, you know, not just proposals, but data that shows that from a quality of game standpoint, this will increase the quality of the game. At some point, there will be that discussion with respect to the onside kick. And in terms the only of- thing I say, Rich, on the onside kicks, yes. as you know, too, is having lost a game by one, we don't want to make it too easy because that the team that's ahead has earned the right uh, to have a chance to win that game. So the historical number has been 13%, and we're good with 13%. The fact that it's crept down to 5%, that, that's that's not a good number. We're not looking for it to go to 25%. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been played to that point, if you know what I mean. So that's where you're trying to find that balance. Rich McKay here on the Rich Eisen Show. The hip drop tackle or swivel? 
hip drop tackle. Um, there, boy, have we seen defenders who have Twitter accounts and microphones on TV shows and radio shows really push back on this, Rich. Uh, what is the rule change? How and how in the world can it be officiated properly in your your mind? Yep. Not any time we make a change like this, um, there's going to be pushback because there are people that say you've taken away a way for me to tackle. Right. So the tackler is at the ultimate disadvantage. The runner is able to make moves and go where they want. The tackler does not have that advantage. They've got to react to that and then get the person down on the ground. So there's no question we made it harder on the tackler. The reason we did and the reason we have in the past when we've had different rules, whether it's the defenseless player rule about the player in the air, you can't hit him, you know, in the head or neck area. Why did we put that in? Because we just said that player is defenseless and you got to hit him some other way than hit him that way because that player can do nothing to defend himself. In this one, what we're really saying, Rich, is in that moment of time, um, what you have is you have a player that's got grasp of, of, a, uh, of a runner got his hands around him, encircled him, has gotten himself unweighted, meaning up in the air, and then has come down and landed um, on their uh, knee or leg. And in that case, we really believe that that person at that point in time, that runner becomes defenseless. They can't get their leg out. Uh, and then when you look at the data, uh, it comes to that, that that tackle, in that only when those three elements are there, creates about a 25 times injury rate than any other tackle. And so in our mind, at that point, the data is just too overwhelming. I absolutely understand uh, the de defensive player's objection that you've taken away something from my ability to tackle. And this is not the first time we've done it. Um, but it's not too dissimilar to when we did the chop block um, protection for the defensive players. Um, the defensive players themselves said, hey, we don't really want this. We can play this block. Even though we're on a block and somebody's hitting our legs, we can play it. We said, we appreciate you saying that, but the data says there are too many injuries here and we got to change it. And we did. Uh, so I just think when, when the data speaks to you and you've got video that backs it up, you make a rule change. And what, what, what I do think to your question is very hard to call on the field. Uh, just like use of the helmets, hard to call on the field, other penalties that we put in the game. But if you don't put a penalty on the books, then it becomes very hard to get the technique out of the game. When you do, through fines, through education, through even a call on the field, you can get it out of the game. That's why we did horse collar. That's why we did use of helmet. And that's why we're doing this one. Do you think that there'll be more fines than calls on the field? Um, no question. Okay. So, and, 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 and I don't want to say fines that, oh, you know, boy, we're trying to take people's money. It will be much more warnings, much more education. Yes, you can get fined, but the object is just to make sure that people are thinking about it and that there's a rule on the books. Because you know what else happens, Rich, when there's a rule on the books? Our coaches practice it in the in training camp. They show them, hey, this is what you can't do, and that is all beneficial in our mind to the game. NFL Competition Committee Chairman Rich McKay here on the Rich Eisen Show. And, you know, uh, the, the concern about the, you know, making this swivel hip drop tackle um, illegal um, is you're adding another speed type decision in a, a faster game every single year to the refs on the field to make yes. Um, yes. in the name of player safety. And instead, we might just see a flag being thrown on a play that to fans, it just looks like they're being flagged for playing football. And in that spirit, I imagine, is the reason why you're expanding the use of replay assist, which is the instant replay system that fans don't really see. I mean, I know they don't see ev they don't see instant replay to be at all, but it's somewhat outside of the somebody's throwing a challenge flag. Referee goes to look at a tablet and makes a decision during a commercial break. So why did you? Add, by the way, I love that you did this, but how do you think it's going to work? Adding which plays or which calls to this system, Rich. Yeah, so it's okay. So you, you opened up an area that is not uncomplicated. A replay assist is a, is a system that we put in where there's a replay assistant with every crew and that replay assistant is sitting up in the booth and has all the video in front of them and is charged with helping the referee uh, during the course of the game. It could be the ball spotting, it, it could be uh, feet in or out. It could, it could be anything that dealt dealt with objective information. They could quickly help the referee on. 
As time has gone on, we've added to replay assist where they could help the referee. In officiating, what we've said is when there's a flag on the field, there are certain calls that if there are objective things that that replay assistant could say into the uh, ear of the uh, referee, then we should try to use them. This year, one of the things we added was um, intentional grounding. One of the hardest calls we have, uh, the reason it's a hard call is because it's a crew call, right? You've got the referee, you've got the official that's in the area where the ball was thrown. You've just got a lot going on. And the referee at that point in time, Rich is charged with the quarterback, right? His number one charge is a protection of the quarterback. Is the quarterback getting sacked? Is the quarterback, you know, get is the, or the weight landing on the quarterback? All those things are in what he's doing. So what we liked was we said, you know, why don't we allow replay assist to help say to him, hey, quarterback is in or out of the pocket? Because you, when you talk to referees, they have a feel for whether the quarterback's in or out of the pocket, but they haven't necessarily been looking at it the whole time mm -hmm. when that play is on. So we, we want to use that. The next thing we wanted to say is there are plenty of plays, and last year we had a number of them we looked at, where there was no pass rush. There's nobody coming at the quarterback. The, the player was four or five yards away, and the quarterback just threw the ball away. We've allowed that forever, but yet there was intentional grounding uh, thrown. We said, no, no, we don't want that called uh, because it, the rule says you have to be you know, in imminent danger of being sacked. So we put that in as an objective thing. If the player is more than two yards away, tell the referee there was no intentional grounding, pick up the flag. So what we're trying to do with replay assist is truly you know, take our time as we go into this. We don't want the person in the box throwing a flag, right? The game has to be officiated in our mind on the field. We do want when there's a flag, if there's objective elements and, and there are penalties where we think they could help, we do want the assistant to be able to help. So that's that's what we're doing. Uh, this kind of came out of the concept that um, John Harbaugh, Coach Harbaugh, and Andy Reid brought a number of years ago about the sky judge and the idea that we should have somebody up there that could you know, help with officiating. We didn't believe that sky judge should be allowed to throw flags. We're still not close to that point. But we do believe that that replay assistant should be able to help the referee. So that's what we're doing. And, and that will be done um, while there is a huddle? between officials because yeah. again well the mechanics said. of yeah. this is so crucial to me rich because i mean just straight up i i'm always been honest with you and and you're so cool for the 20 years i've known you to, to understand where this is coming from that there's so many people think you know with gambling going on and you know and then they have this prop or that prop that the that all of a sudden a flag gets picked up and they think it's been done because somebody in the league doesn't want the other team to win you know what yeah. I mean? And so so yeah. that's why I, and, knowing the mechanics yeah. is so crucial of this. It is. And I think one thing we're going to do this year, and we talked about it at the committee, and I like where we came out on it, is we used to say when the referee would come and, and face you and say, he'd say after discussion, you know, it was determined there was no intentional grounding. You're going to change this year. When the replay assistant actually does uh, say something or impact the referee, the referee is going to say, after consultation with the replay assistant, okay. the flag is picked up. We're going to try to make it clear to you at home and you in the stadium what's going on. Because to your point, it's one thing for the people at home and, and begin to think things, but people in the stadium don't know either. And so our idea was let's be very clear and very um, transparent on what is impacting the call and why, and that's what um, what we'll do. And then in terms of roughing the passer, we'll, we'll know if, if somebody was – uh, maybe hit in a legal area? Will, will there be yes. sort of, because sometimes you'll see like a grazing of the helmet. Is there going to be a degree of 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 weather? No, that was a, no degree. No degrees. And well said. No, no degree, because what we said in that one was, because again, we're really trying to go slow here on replay assist. What we said is in the area of roughing the passer, we probably looked at, you know, I'm going to say we looked at eight fouls that were called where the call was that there was a blow to the head or neck area and the player, defense player, did not touch the quarterback in the head or neck area. He hit him in a way that his body you know, moved mm -hmm. and according to the referee threw the flag. We said, listen, if there's no contact, none, if we, I think we use the word any, uh, if there's no contact, then we will pick that flag up. That would be another instance where the replay assistant would say to the referee, no, he did not touch the quarterback in the head or neck area. And if he didn't, the flag will be picked up. 
What about using this for all 15-yard roughing penalties, Rich? Because, you know, the number of times that a safety or a defensive back will hit yep. a, a receiver in an area where you want them to hit, and it does look so violent that a flag gets thrown. What about where, where does the competition committee or the membership land on that subject matter with replay assist? The, the biggest difference to me would be, I, I'd use these two words, subjective, objective. The more we stay in the objective world, uh, meaning there is a pure bright line of what was called and that bright line was wrong, we should try to fix it. If we get into the subjective world, we are real concerned because we want the game called on the field because that's full speed and those referees are really good and officials are really good at what they're calling. So I would say to you, just you know, like I said earlier, we're trying to take this very slowly as far as replay assist having yes. an impact on the game. We don't want the game, we don't want that person to ultimately officiate the game. We do want that person to help us get it right. All right, last one for you, Rich. It's a moment for me. You know where I'm going with this one. The fumbling ah. th through the end zone, giving the ball yeah. to the defense because the offensive player had the misfortune of fumbling it or the defensive player made a play, understand. Uh, but uh, the misfortune of the ball not rolling out at the one-inch line, but just a couple of inches on the other side of the pylon. It sounded like Troy Vincent was making it sound, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not blaming anybody, but he got my hopes up when he started talking about uh, that being maybe a little too punitive. And then it didn't even wind up on the final list of conversation, Rich. What, what, uh, what happened with this rule? I think it was because of you. I think most people were targeting you. And uh, really, felt, I, I heard a couple of people say, we don't want to help Eisen out here. Okay, understood. Understood. That's and understand. They said if he gets in the fives, if he breaks six in the four, <laughs> then we'll begin to talk about it. But I would tell you in the conversation, um, nice. always there's always a number of things that come up, right, every yeah. year, and they're, and, they're, and they're talked about. This is one that's been talked about a long time. Um and uh, I would, you know, I, I literally would quote one of the great coaches of all time, uh, Coach Shula, on this play. Uh, that's how long we've been talking about this when I was on the committee with him. Mm. And he said, there's only one person that can control this action, and that's the ball carrier. And uh, and so he kind of put the thing on us that, you know, this has been a part of football, and that person can control it. They should have the ball in the outside arm, and they shouldn't be reaching uh, and so we've we've always left this one alone, um, but it's not been without conversation. I think this last year there were three of them uh, that happened, um, and one of them was our game. Hmm. Uh, it was uh, us against um, the Bucks, and the and Winfield made a great play, but our quarterback had the ball in the wrong arm. He had the ball in the inside arm. He had the ball in the outside arm. He scores. Uh, so um, for us, that that was just one of. You know, we talked about it as a committee. In order to get something going as a committee, you, you got to have at least the majority, and then you got to find a way to get it proposed. And that didn't happen this year. Man. Don't give up. You get in the fives next year. Yeah. We'll talk about it again. I hear you, Rich. Maybe I can get in the fives later on next month. But you know, I can't. I can't fight like Don Shula wanted it this way. Like I'm never. <laughs> I'm never going to win that battle. Don't Come go on. Against the coach. I just. I, we had this discussion. I mean. <laughs> And, and the other one was the idea in those days, as you remember, most of the old school coaches were, don't you ever reach the ball, ever, at any time. Today, the way it's caught is only reach it on fourth down, you know, only reach it when you're, and and uh, and still we, you know, as you know, we still have players that, that do it and put the ball at risk. And I'm not saying that's always the case. Sometimes the defender makes an incredible play, but this has just been one that it hasn't ever had enough uh, momentum to get itself, you know, proposed as a rule, or certainly to get to 24 votes, which, as you know, is not a low bar. No, it's not. It's it's quite a bit. Hey, Rich, thanks for the time. Great to chat with you yes. as always. Yes, um, you know, uh, best of luck um, in in the draft season and beyond. And I hope to chat again real soon because obviously Thank this you. this is a nonstop conversation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Talk you bet. To you. you bet. That's the chairman of the NFL competition the competition committee, Rich McKay, here on the Rich Eisen Show. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.